From there, I was taken to Stalaga three with an escort of two or three uh, airmen or, or you know, German airmen. I was glad to have them when we were, I think, on uh, Stuttgart Station because people were spitting and wanted to tear me apart because what, to them I was the terror flieger. We went by train from uh, there to uh, uh, Zagen railway station. And uh, in fact, the railway station is little changed. You know, it, 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 it's quite uncanny in a way. And I can't remember how we went from the station to the camp, which is about a mile away, uh, whether it was truck or walked or... Uh, when we got into the camp, and, and the prisoners used to call new arrivals milk bottles because they were very white. I mean, we were flying at night. We didn't see much daylight. And I was a qu question, uh, we were all questioned to see whether we were plants from the enemy. And then we were allocated a, a room and uh, given uh, you know, a knife, fork and spoon and things like that, which I still have actually. Um, although the, the, the fork prongs are broken off and the knife is broken halfway because I used it as a, what we would describe as a pranger uh, to make tin plates, uh, you know, as a hammer. Uh, anyway, after I'd been there a little while, the uh, Great Escape took place. I, um, I mean, I, I, I was not directly involved. I mean, it had been going on for months. The people who went out were mainly People who have been prisoners for a long time or prisoners who have been directly involved in digging or uh, were uh, continentals, could speak a language and had a better chance. For example, a chap named Tobolsky, who was a Pole, and, uh, uh, and Wednesday went out together. Um, the, the night before, those who were in the lead of the tunnel going first were moved into the hut to, so there wouldn't be too much turbulence and, and the uh, hut was crowded. Um, we knew the escape was taking place and then we heard a shot in the night and realised that it, it had been discovered. Um, you hear lots of people, I've heard people saying, I was in a tunnel. The only reason I was saved was there was a bend in the tunnel, otherwise the bullet would have hit me. It was absolute rubbish, and uh, I, I, one of our members was so, so incensed with this correspondent in the newspaper. A very distinguished digger, uh, who became a digger because he was Welsh, and they thought all oh, Welsh people were miners, or he'd never touched it. He was a tough character, but um, he, I remember <coughs> Ken Reese phoning me and saying, Charles, if all the people who claimed to be there and be involved got together on, or in the camp, there wouldn't be room for them all. And it's perfectly true. You know, I've heard so much rubbish. Um, the, another interesting thing was the chap in charge of the tunneling had been a miner. So, but he was Canadian, and in fact he acted as the um, technical advisor on the film of Great Escape. He had been a miner, but he was an open cast miner. <laughs> so, but anyway, he he was in charge. Wally Flurry. Um, we were, life in the camp was uh, pretty tedious, and also we never knew what was going to happen to us. Oh, sorry. The night, the night after the, uh, the, tunnel, the escape was discovered, we were held out on the parade ground. It was bitterly cold all day, virtually, while they counted and recounted to try to establish how many people had escaped. And they counted and counted uh, with little help from us because we kept moving around deliberately. Um, then... I think they stopped food right, coming in and lots of things like that. Um, 
the we were fortunate the senior British officer interesting thing about the camp in officer camps the senior British officer by seniority was uh, the boss for one of a better description in the NCO camps they had a different system they voted and uh, a man of confidence, which is quite different, whether it be Army or Air Force. Uh, I mean, if Dixie Deans was a man of confidence that most people remember. Uh, anyway, for, we, we uh, during the rest of the time in Star Wars 3, we, we didn't know what was going to happen to us. After the sh I'm sorry, I, I really ought to have said about it. The senior British officer uh, was uh, a group captain, and he was about to be uh, repatriated on the Gothenburg. I think there were two repatriations during the war. The, and this was a few weeks after. And this was fortuitous, because he was able to uh, give the information about the shooting and the murdering firsthand to the extent that uh, Anthony Eden stood up in Parliament and said, we will uh, exert exemplary justice on when we find the culprits. And in fact, the wing commander, who was an ex-policeman, who did the investigation post-war, called his book Exemplary Justice. Um, and in fact, many moons, he was given an OBE many moons afterwards. Uh, his OB was stolen, after, and after he was uh, he died, um, the RF we held a ceremony uh, at Henlow, in which we presented a, a duplicate OB to his family, and they in turn gave it back to the uh, the uh, service police. Uh, department detachment there because that's uh, they're based at Hendler and it's probably still there. Um, anyway, food was very short, and uh, cigarettes were plentiful. Uh, when the Germans were beastly, they, apart from stopping them, uh, stopping the food coming in, the food, they they also punctured the tin so we couldn't. Uh, uh, haul them for escaping, uh, although escaping had been forbidden by the senior British officer anyway. Uh, as uh, we followed, when the invasion came, we expected to be home the following day, kind of thing. Of course, it went on, on, on. We were very disappointed. We followed the invasion progress. Uh, we had a BBC radio, and the news used to be read every day. Um, the uh, the Germans also had their news bulletin, and the map we kept up public. It was uh, updated by the German news and not by us. And there's an apocryphal story that the commandant of the camp asked the uh, senior British officer. Where exactly are the British now? Whether it's true or not, I didn't know, because he knew we had the radio. One story about the radio, there was a, a, a Church of England Anglican a priest, minister in the camp. He, uh, it was army because obviously our RF chaplains don't fly. Um, he, uh, say he was the only chaplain or minister, he was an Anglican. Another chap turned up who was uh, uh, Presbyterian, and he was army, he came to the camp. And uh, in his book, it was interesting, he said, uh, I met the other chap, uh, the minister, minister, he greeted me warmly, but his sermons were dull. Uh, uh, when the People often don't understand why there are no Americans in the film The Great Escape. Although they were uh, not on the film, in actual, uh, there are no Americans killed. 
The reason was the Americans were involved in the digging, but before the, the escape, they were moved. And there's a story that it was uh, one of the how they would get the news across the wire. I mean, the Americans in a new camp would take time to either build a radio or scrum the parts. And someone hits upon the idea of just shouting it across the wire. Now, this seemed to be quite insecure. But uh, the uh, oh, it was uh, the uh, the answer was very simple, and I've just forgotten the word for a second. Uh, it was sh shouted the cross in the Scottish language, Gaelic. Uh, sorry, Gaelic. Uh, the uh, and of course, there's not hope in hell of any German speaking Gaelic. Um, that particular uh, chap, the Scot, uh, came back and, in fact, was the minister in the Pond Street Church, just off of Sloan Square, Sloan Street, and eventually became the moderator of the Free Church of Scotland. Um, and when he died, uh, Brown, the former Prime Minister, attended his funeral because Brown's father was, was a contemporary of, of this minister. And in fact, I think the minister uh, christened Brown's child. Uh, uh, anyway, we, we, uh, we were very short of food. And so much so that if we got a loaf of bread that was made of wooden, uh, made of sawdust virtually, there was one bread cutter on the camp and with a bit of like you might book it i mean uh, uh, um, and you'd then cut as many slices as possible you'd bring it back put them on the table then you'd cut cards for choice of slice just in case one had a spend some more than the other if we had a what we called glop which usually was running with weevils occasionally um we would do the same we would ladle up the glop into bowls, and then uh, cut cards, just in case one had a spoonful more than the other. Then we would cut cards, who would lick out the container. Um, as I say, cigarettes were plentiful because they were, uh, they were duty-free in Canada and America, and the Germans were quite illogical in a way because they seemed to let those in when they wouldn't allow food. The cigarettes were used as a currency. Every, uh, we had a uh, an exchange shop called Food Echo. When I say shop, it's a little room, and every you could buy any sort of uh, commodity that came in a food parcel, but it was priced in terms of cigarettes. And if I'm not mistaken, I didn't smoke. I believe a tuppenny bar of chocolate was a thousand cigarettes. And I remember saving up and eventually getting a, it's a Hershey bar, a hard chocolate. And uh, breaking it up, then cutting the knobs of chocolate in half, uh, cleaning the teeth, we had no toothpaste. Um, and uh, uh, getting on my pit, as we call our beds, uh, with lights out at 10 o'clock and putting this little knob of chocolate in my tongue to see how long I could make it last. It was a sheer luxury. Um, we dined as, well, uh, as a, with the room, so we pulled all our, our rations. And uh, you had one stove in the room which threw out very little heat, and you just about boil a kettle on it. But you were allocated a half hour uh, and it rotated for the one kind of cooking stove in the hut. And so you had to have everything ready to throw on the stove and off again in the 30 minutes. Uh, we had two or three people in the uh, room who were reasonable cooks, who at least uh, were prepared to cook. Um, at night, the uh, say the the shutters came down at dusk, and we were locked in. Interesting. Every 
day we had a quiet period, and I think it was between either one and three o'clock or something like that, where you were forbidden to make a noise to enable people to either rest or read or do whatever they wanted to. Uh, it, was, it was good discipline. We had two parades a day, uh, and usually when we were on parade, the f ferrets would become particularly active, uh, s searching rooms. In the prison camp, uh, we had one film I remember shown in all the time I was there. And what I remember ab about it is the either power was cut off or the uh, projector broke. It was in a, while well, someone was singing a song called At Last. Uh, 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 and so we never did hear the end of it. It was a very popular tune at the time. But uh, I, 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 I suppose uh, the Judy Garland, uh, Shirley Temple things were, were, were popular at the time. And how was morale in the Air Force during the war? It's very good. Uh, we were young, fit, and I'm talking about air crew, really, young, fit, filtered. I mean, to get in the POW camp, you'd been filtered so many times. You'd had uh, volunteers selected, examined, interrogated, and then shot down. You'd survive. You got in the camp, and you're still alive. So it was a great filtration system, and I don't think there was any problem around. The, and I, people often ask me about... Uh, Lack of moral fiber. I never met anyone uh, that I had were classified LMF. One person I met after the war uh, intrigued me because I'm sure he was uh, commissioned, and then he claimed he became a flight sergeant. Uh, his story is that uh, he decided that he didn't want to be an instructor. I can't believe that's true. But, you know, one suspects that that might be the case, but I could be easily be wrong. Um, the other thing, too, is uh, uh, survival after the war. The, uh, once again, we were all young, fit, and uh, didn't have post-war stress. But I know two people who actually went into the mental homes. Uh, one was a friend of mine who was in period of UK. Uh, he was put in a mental home. Uh, and uh, there was another one who died recently. I went to his funeral. He had two or three sessions in a mental home. So some people were affected. We were... I said, not allowed, not encouraged to talk to the guards. The guards, uh, uh, there are specific contacts that were appointed to keep in touch with individuals that help the bribery and all the rest that goes with it. Uh, uh, and there are ferrets in the camp. And these are the guards I have in mind. Those are on the outside. You know, I mean, they are manning the central box and thing. But the so-called ferrets, who used to probe around, because the uh, huts were raised on uh, bricks, so they could probe underneath them. Um, and say so they, they had people allocated to them, uh, uh, which was a jolly good move, really. Uh, one, one chap tells a story where one, Andy Wiseman, but then he had so many stories, I'm not sure it's true. Uh, he said a, 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 a ferret came into his room and uh, said uh, he was looking for, what was it, maps or something. And Andy said, look, I've got this. He said, no, I'm looking for maps. But whether that's true or not, I don't know. And how did the guards seem when the news of the executions was released? 
I, I had no direct knowledge of that, but I can say the commandant was shocked. Uh, and in fact, the story of him, he was caught martialed after that. Uh, one of his crimes was, it was an acoustic device uh, that ringed the camp, and it was not working. It was being repaired or something, and that was one of his crimes. The story goes that he was a good uh, English family, a good German family, and because of that, he was uh, put into a mental home to escape the court martial. Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. And uh, that eventually he was released, and in fact returned to that area as second in command of the defence force. Now, whether it's true or not, uh, but what I think is true that. This chap who became moderator of the Free Church of Scotland uh, kept in touch with him after the war to the extent that he officiated at this funeral. Uh, now, whether that was a, his request or the request of the family. Yeah. And how did you and the others feel when you heard about the news of the the executions. Shocked because it was always said that in the early days it was very much easier. I mean, you hear, there's no doubt about it, uh, escaping was a sport in the early days. Uh, but, you know, come the time of Stalag three and things like that, it was no longer a sport. The Germans, and I'll show you later, put up a notice, said, uh, escaping is no longer a sport, you'd be shot. Uh, no one knows how the 50 were uh, chosen. Yeah, it's quite inexplicable. Uh, no one's really... Uh, that, that is a, a, a depiction of the tunnel. Uh, I'll pull it out in, if you want to. And all around it is the of the pictures of the 50 who were murdered. Mm -hmm. Now, that was... Chapolsky was uh, caught in Stettin with Wings Day. Uh, Chapolsky was murdered. Wings Day was put in Sachsenhausen. Uh, and once again, it's a remarkable story. Um, Chapolsky's... No, I can't remember what stage they moved to Canada. Anyway, Tobolsky's widow and son, Paul, used to come to our reunions. When the widow died, uh, Paul, the son, commissioned that in memory of his father. And it's a limited edition. And I, I was given a few... Uh, which I've distributed to Messrs and the RF Club. I mean, I could sell them for a fortune. Uh, but uh, I've got some pictures there of the Long March and other things there, lots of pictures there of sorts. And what's your, what are your thoughts on Roger Bushell? Well, I didn't really know him. I met him, so it's very difficult to judge. But from his reputation... I don't think he would have succeeded in the Air Force. He was too much an individual, but that's just reading. I mean, it's not first-hand. He was a remarkable man. And what, uh, once again, the, uh, I went down to Brixham off the war. It must have been about 50 uh, must be in 55, I suppose. And to my surprise, there was a, a fishing trawler in the harbour uh, called the Roger Bush, or I often wonder what the connection was. And what was your daily routine in the camp? Exercise each day, walking along the uh, so-called bashing the circuit, walking around the outside, gossiping, 
reading, there was a good reference library. Uh, ref, well, it was a good library anyway, with lots of books. Um, we'd play cards. Uh, a lot of, I say, a lot of reading. Uh, and uh, you got your own chores, your own laundry, and we made uh, a doby stick out of a tin can and a, and a stick in a pail, and you kept prodding it to. Uh, when you wash your head, you had a, 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 a pail of water, hot water, to do your adobe. You had to get it from the kitchen so-called kitchen, uh, you do, you, you had some very hard German soap to do the laundry, you were. and then uh, trying to hang it up dry, it was difficult. In the winter, you'd put it out on the lawn, on the, uh, on a, a line, and uh, then you'd bring it in and you could stand it up against the wall, it was frozen to, to that extent, so. Um, and that was a, a struggle to get it dry. Uh, I mean, we didn't have much to do, just our underwear and shirts and socks. And we, we didn't have a lot of gear. And what? And just before the march began, I think I read somewhere, maybe it's wrong, that the uh, Star of Love 3 was kind of dismantled by the prisoners, was it? Or... Star of Love 3? Yeah. Was it dismant any of the camp dismantled when the march began? Or dismantled. Yeah. No, right. no. Uh, I mean, I I use the uh, an old Red Cross box. So our, our seating was made out of kind of tea chests, uh, uh, the Red Cross tea chests. Um, I put a couple of runners on the Red Cross box, and they were two. Uh, Bedboards, and we had no tools. I think uh, I mean, we sort of got some nails out of the wall and hammered those in. I mean, it's, um, it wasn't this man's that we didn't have time or, or the inclination to worry about that. Uh, we had lots of cigarettes, not personally, but the cigarettes had been held in the Food Echo, for example, uh, we uh, tried, i say we generally, uh, tried to make them unusable, and of course they won't burn, cigarettes won't burn, uh, and uh, so people were urinating on them, so make sure they didn't use, I mean it was a, a silly problem to have after you know, thinking how short we had been. We were there on a Sunday, uh, we had, there were lots of lectures of sorts, you know, from psychology to meteorology, people put on the thing. Uh, I mean, people, I'm just trying to think, a very famous uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, this, Took a law degree in the early days in the NCO camp. Uh, or I just uh, trying to think of his name. Um, so uh, the, the the library, the most popular book was funny was uh, uh, the Sex Life. It it was an illustrated the Sex Life of a Savage, and I think there was a two year waiting list for that. Did you get red, red Cross parcels delivered? Occasionally, uh, spasmodically. There was no regular supplies. Some of the German. Often you'd have a half uh, a Red Cross parcel per man. Not that you'd split it. Uh, I mean, we pulled it in the room, all, all the uh, sort of Red Cross parcels. They weren't given out individually. Uh, uh, Germans were quite illogical in a way, but certainly they stopped at the time of the Great Escape and things like that. And yet the cigarettes came in. 
As the war continued, uh, was anyone worried at all that the Germans might start executing other airmen? As... Oh, sure. That's what I said earlier. It was the uncertainty of what would happen to us at the end. Having murdered the 50, anything was possible. We didn't know whether we would be murdered, held as hostages, or, or what. And even now, I don't think anyone really knows what the intention was, whether they were going to uh, use us as hostage or not. What, could you tell me a bit more about the morning when Harry was discovered? Well, we were put on the uh, parade ground and kept there nearly all day in in the... I mean, it was freezing. Uh, whilst they counted and recounted us to establish how many were missing. And, you know, Red Cross parcels were stopped and things like that. This may or may not be a true story, but I saw an interview with someone, I think Jack Lyon, his name was. I knew him. Yeah, where he said, like, the commandant threatened to shoot a prisoner that, that, that was continuing to move around or something. I don't know if that's true or not. Possible, you know, once again, I, I've never heard that one. Yeah. Tempers were short. I mean, it's, you can imagine the frustration of the Germans to think that 50 had got away, or... A number had got away then. Did you think it was a good idea at the time to try and get, well, 50 out at once? Or, or set, what, to set, escape? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I mean, when you think how they had to mobilise the whole country to search for them, that in itself was uh, worth it, I think. You know, the emotion of effort on the day. Yeah, people often ask about the Great Escape film. My answer every time is this. It's a good film, entertaining film. There's too much saluting, too much of an Oxford accent all the time. Uh, the Too many uniforms, and we didn't have all... There were some uniforms that chaps had, had sent them in the early days of the war. Uh, but, and of course, Steve McQueen wasn't there. But who would remember the 50 were murdered without the film The Great Escape? 